On paper and at first glance, it might seem like the display is where Google's cut corners to nail that pricing to get it lower. Cause hey, it only has Gorilla Glass 3, the refresh rate is only 90 hertz, it's got these thick, thick bezels, and I'm sure you've all heard and read reports of how the peak brightness is not that great. Now, in reality though, the display here on the Pixel 7a, it is actually quite good. It's slightly smaller than what you find on the Pixel 7 at 6.1 inches, yes, but it is an amazing panel. Now, I remember saying this in my Pixel 6a review. Though that phone had only a 60Hz panel, given how consistent Google software was, I actually didn't really feel like I was using a 60Hz panel. And I kind of had the same feeling here too. Well, yes, it's technically only 90Hz. Google's solid consistency with the software makes it feel a whole lot smoother. Not for a minute when I was using the 7a did I regret not having a higher refresh screen. Now do keep in mind for some weird reason, 90Hz or as Google likes to call it, smooth display, it's not enabled out of the box, though it was on the Pixel 7. Now coming to that brightness part, Google doesn't really advertise a peak brightness, but GSM Arena measured a maximum of 1070 nits with the auto brightness mode, which is not great, but at the same time it's not particularly bad either. Now, I've gone on rides with this phone mounted on my handlebar with Google Maps being used for navigation and I've really not had any issues. Personally, I feel the brightness peak isn't great but it's nowhere close to as bad as people have been making it out to be. That said, when I did go on those rides, the 7a, it did get toasty. Of course, we are talking Dubai, the desert, in peak summer, everything here gets toasty. But now, jokes apart, with regular use, I never found this 7a to overheat, I never found it getting uncomfortably hot. But with gaming or shooting 4K, uh, 4K 60 video in particular, it does tend to get heated up. And it's pretty noticeable when you're using the phone without a case, since what you're seeing here is a metal frame. That said, I still wouldn't say it's bad enough to be a deal breaker. Now the build, this is another area which at first glance appears, you know, it appears to be an area where Google's cut corners to lower that price. Because the back here, unlike on the 7 or the 7 Pro, it is plastic. Now that's it, the frame, the camera bar, it's all aluminium. And the 7a also feels pretty solid in hand. The back feels quite similar to the more expensive pixels. But at the end of the day, it is plastic, so it is going to be more scratch prone. A case is going to be mandatory here. Now apart from that, the 7a feels very nice in hand, yes the bezels are pretty chunky, but still given the display is smaller, 6.1 inches, it is pretty narrow, it feels very comfortable to hold and use in hand at just 72.9 millimeters. The 194 gram weight also helps and I found no creaking or wobbling of any kind, so the build quality is pretty good. Now yeah, that camera array, it does protrude, not as much as it does on the 7, but it still does protrude. But because it is a bar and it's even, there is no wobbling when you set this phone down on a surface and try using it. The IP rating is slightly lower, IP67 instead of 68 like on the 7 and 7 Pro, but honestly, I don't see that or I don't think anyone's gonna see that as a big issue. Now there is one area where Google's absolutely not compromised at all, and that's with the performance. Now the chip on the inside, before we take a look at that, Hey, my name's Ash, you're watching C4E Tech, and if you do find this video interesting, useful, or both, give it a thumbs up, subscribe. Now coming back, the Pixel 7a sports the same SoC on the inside as its more expensive stablemates. This here is Google's own Tensor G2 that's been paired with 8 gigs of RAM and 128 gigs of storage, which is not expandable. Well, technically this is Google's current flagship SoC. It's not gonna bench the same as a flagship Qualcomm or MediaTek chip. Hell, even the Snapdragon 8 Gen 1 or the 7 Plus Gen 2 that's found on much cheaper phones, they do bench higher. That said, if you want raw performance, you're not really gonna be looking at a Google Pixel because that's not what Google does. No Pixel has ever topped benchmark charts, has it? Pixels have always been about the user experience and that the experience here that's absolutely excellent. This is Android 13, the Google way. So you don't see any third party extras, but you do get Google's little things, like the theming stuff, transcription for voice notes, which I absolutely adore, music track detection and now playing and now playing history, which basically detects and keeps track of what songs are playing in the surrounding. There's quick tap, which lets you perform certain actions when you tap the back. Then there's Extreme Battery Saver. If you're into Google's ecosystem and are a fan of that stock Google experience, this is gonna be right up your alley. 
The solid specs underneath means the Pixel 7a, it always felt responsive. With regular day-to-day -day use, I never felt like I wasn't using a flagship phone. With things like gaming though, like I already said, the Tensor G2 is not at the bleeding edge of what a smartphone is capable of doing. It can still run all the games you want and it doesn't throttle too bad either. 76% stability isn't all that bad. For example, Genshin played just fine at high settings, maybe an occasional frame drop here and there when things got a little too crowded. But for the most part, even after 30 minutes, it ran fine. Beat it up, we do get stereo audio output here. The earpiece pulls double duty as a stereo speaker. It sounds quite as good as the Pixel 7. Here, have a listen. Now, Google does promise three years of Android version updates and five years of security patches for the Pixel 7a, which sadly is no longer the best in the industry because that on and off belongs to Samsung for their four years of Android version updates and five years of security patch guarantee. Now, it is still worth keeping in mind that with Google, you're gonna get those updates on day one or very close to day one. So that's gonna be a differentiating factor if you give it any value. Now, since we did touch upon gaming and everything, let's talk about battery. Now, I, I'd call the battery situation on the 7A as slightly below par. Not because the battery life isn't good, because there is a 4385mAh battery on the inside, and it usually lasted me through a day of typical use with absolutely no issues. I'll end my days with about 30% or more left in the tank easily. Now, the reason why I call this situation slightly below par is because, well, there is no charger in the box. Maybe let's look past that because sadly, it's becoming more and more the trend these days. Now, even if you were to buy a charger separately, the max it supports is 18 watt, which means with about a half hour of charging, you're gonna be going from zero to say 30%. A full charge took me almost two hours in my testing, which for a 45,000 rupee phone in 2023, not good, not good at all. Now, Google does offer wireless charging, yes, but it's a measly seven and a half watts, which means it's not something you can use for quick top ups. It's more like if you have a wireless charging dock by your bedside, you could get the 7A back to 100% by the time you go to sleep and wake up. Or like MKBHD said in his video, if you have a wireless car charger, it should help stop the battery from dropping. Basically, well, I'm happy that they've included wireless charging here. The actual speeds have kind of stopped me from really utilizing it. On the flip side, we have the optics which is something I couldn't stop myself from using. Now, there are only two sensors here. Google's finally moved past the IMX363 that we saw on the Pixel 6a, a sensor that they've used for like four generations straight. Now, this time we get a new Sony sensor, a 64 megapixel IMX787 that's paired with an optically stabilized f1.9 lens. Do note that you can't actually shoot full resolution 64 megapixel shots, only quad bin 16 megapixel ones. That said, the highlight here is Google's processing. Just see how the image changes from when you've shot the pic to the final result you get. It's typically Google. We get that heavy contrast. The details retained very well in both the highlights as well as the shadows. So excellent dynamic range. The skin tones turned out fine too. Now under low light, I wasn't really surprised that this camera continued to impress. Night side does get auto triggered, but if you want, you can also force it manually. Images continue to look great, lots of detail, low noise levels. The 7A easily has one of the best cameras in its segment. With video, you can shoot it up to 4K 60. There is a bit of EIS jitter that you can see from time to time, but overall the same contrast and dynamic range we saw with the stills, that's preserved. The secondary is yet another Sony sensor, the IMX712 this time. This is a 13 megapixel sensor that's paired with an ultra wide f2.2 lens. I love how the colors have been kept uniform by Google, very nicely matched with the primary. The dynamic range for an ultra wide, pretty impressive. Now there is a lot of distortion at the edges though. That's something I feel Google could have or rather should have fixed. But for the most part, no complaints. On the front, we get a new selfie shooter too. This is a 13 megapixel f2.2. It's got a pretty wide field of view for those group shots. Now we are talking selfies on a pixel. Of course, again, no surprises that the 7A doesn't disappoint. Detail, contrast, dynamic range, even the edge deduction, it was all excellent. Google also lets you shoot 4K 30 via the selfie camera. And again, no complaints with the quality. Now guys, there is one thing I should have probably spoken about earlier, the SIM situation. 
Like with the other Pixel 7 series phones, this one takes only one physical SIM, though you can add a secondary SIM in the form of an eSIM. Now this could either be seen as a pro or a con depending on how you see eSIMs, whether you see them as a convenience or an inconvenience. Anyway, that's pretty much it about the 7A. To me, even at an inflated 44,000 rupee asking price, the Pixel 7a seems to be a very good phone to buy if you want the Google experience, the quick software updates, the excellent, excellent cameras. Now, if you're looking for the best performer in this segment, that's definitely not this phone. If gaming's your topmost priority, I'd suggest you look elsewhere, look at the OnePlus 11R, go cheaper, take a gamble on the Poco F5. Now there is one other alternative, a phone that comes with almost the same set of pros and cons, one that's readily available and also available at a cheaper asking price. Renewed Pixel 7s, I've been seeing a lot of these on Amazon. If you don't mind buying Renewed, then the Pixel 7 will do everything the 7a does, but better for a thousand rupees lesser. So there you have it, my take on the Pixel 7a. If you have anything to add, leave a comment. See you next time. Bye-bye.